Welcome to Grassroot Ohio, conversations with everyday people working on important issues here in Columbus and all around Ohio. I'm Carolyn Harding, and today I'm talking with Judge Terry Jamison, candidate for the Ohio Supreme Court. Judge Terry Jamison began her work history in social work with the West Virginia Department of Welfare. She became a trailblazer when she was one of few women to join the United Mine Workers of America. She moved to Columbus, Ohio, when mass layoffs shut the mines down. As a single parent, she worked a variety of jobs before becoming a small business owner for more than 16 years. She became a non-traditional student at Columbus State Community College, ultimately graduating cum laude from Franklin University with a Bachelor of Science degree. She enrolled in Capital University Law School where she obtained her Juris Doctor degree. And as an attorney, she stood besides families in crisis, not corporations, representing them in various courts around Ohio and in US District Court, in administrative hearings, and later being hired to preside over unemployment compensation claims. She comes to this campaign with more than a decade as a judge, having served on the Franklin County Court Domestic Relations and Juvenile Branch, and now on the Court of Appeals, 10th District. Judge Jameson has often been quoted, when the law is not on your side, you deserve to be heard, treated with dignity and respect. Welcome to Grassroot Ohio. Thank you, Carolyn, for having me. When everyday folk go to the polls, most voters have an idea of who the candidates are, what party they re represent, and if they are engaged, they may have some idea of the candidates platforms, but even engaged voters get a bit overwhelmed when it comes to judges. There are usually many judge judges on the ballot and very few opportunities to hear what each candidate hopes to bring to the table. Ohio early voting started February 21 and primary election day is March 19. And my hope is that each voter does their own due diligence for all the candidates on their ballot and all Ohioans will vote for the Supreme Court opening in November. In 2020, you were elected to the 10th District Court of Appeals for the state of Ohio, which comprises all of Franklin County. What are your duties in this position? Thank you, Carolyn. A uh, good question. The duties in this position, you sit as a three judge panel and you hear appeals from any of the lower trial courts and the Ohio Court of Claims where you sue the state of Ohio. You may hear some administrative appeals and you may hear some original actions such as for a petition for a mandamus. A mandamus is a writ that requires a governmental agency to act. You might hear a writ of prohibition, which prevents a governmental agency from acting. So there are some um, things that we hear like that as well. We work as a three-judge panel, as I said. We review the transcript. We do not take new evidence. We only review the transcript and the evidence uh, exhibits that were admitted by the trial court then we will make a ruling. Our rulings are not made from the bench, but they are only made in writing. So please talk about your journey to where you are here and now. Talk about your progression and your desire and decision to become a lawyer and a judge. Well, frankly, my decision uh, to become a lawyer was kind of thrust upon me. Um, in my small business, I was an insurance agency, and I was working for a um, Allstate insurance company. In the mid '90s, uh, late they started talking about changes, changing our compensation structure, and all of those things. And they ultimately made a decision to terminate all agent contracts um, as employees and to enter into independent contractor agreements with you. So um, if you were with the company 20 years or more and age 55, then you could go ahead and retire. I was at 16 years. 
Um, so, and was not 55. So I was not of retirement age. So I took the independent contract. We, um, as a, a class action of agents, sued Allstate for age discrimination because the policy affected predominantly um, all agents that were 40 years old and older. So I've had personal experience with how the law can be applicable. I've had personal experience with being discriminated against because of my age. I grew up in segregation in West Virginia. Brown versus Board of Education became the law in the mid 50s. They did not desegregate the schools in my county until the mid to late 60s. So I actually started school in an all-Black school and uh, transferred into the uh, predominant school in um, elementary school. So the, the law has had a personal application to me at least twice in my life. So when um, that contract change came up, I decided to sell the agency and go to law school because I began to see that anyone can be affected by situations where the law becomes important to you in a personal nature. So what are some of the most gratifying moments in your career as a judge? In my career as a judge, some of, there's been several, but when I was in the domestic relations and juvenile court, I was seeing the same individuals in my court month after month because they could not pay their child support. Um, little known fact, almost 300 men and women are incarcerated in the state of Ohio for failure to pay child support. Um, so having a contempt in domestic court is sometimes the initial step. So I was seeing the individuals, the same individuals over and over. And I said, there has to be a different way to do this. So I pulled together uh, community organizations, uh, Lutheran Social Services, um, Goodwill, Godman Guild, uh, just to name a few, uh, Child Support Enforcement, Director Susan Brown, um, and BMV. We pulled them together, brought them to the court, and began to bring in interns at, that were students at the College of Social Work at OSU to do uh, just a minimal assessment of where, where type of um, education they might need, what type of certification, um, if they were just laid off from another job, could we help them get into another employment opportunity? We brought in um, many of the uh, temporary agencies. I brought in unions. I brought in people so that they could uh, work together to try to find a solution to their employment situation rather than us incarcerating them. And if you do a contempt finding and incarceration of 30 days at $100 a day minimal, in Franklin County Jail, you have spent $3,000, but you have not resolved the issue that will be coming back. So the COMPASS program was birthed in, I think, August of 2014. Uh, we actually received an award from the National Association of Counties and a recommendation from uh, the county commissioners because we were saving anywhere from 300 to $400,000 a year in not incarcerating these individuals. The organizations that we were working with were already funded from uh, their own funding sources, but they needed individuals. So COMPAS program was very important to me. The other thing, uh, since I've been on the Court of Appeals, I'm on the board at Franklin University in the Advisory Board for Global Healthcare Education. I started a scholarship at Franklin for single parents that are working toward degree completion of an associate or an undergrad degree. That was important to me because I knew what I needed when I was going through as a single parent and non-traditional student. And many times uh, motherhood or fatherhood will stop you from completing your degree. So that's something else that I did. And I'm really just um, trying to get back to the people that 
I believe that I can help them. So you are currently a candidate for the Ohio Supreme Court. I am. Why? Why? There is a sense that the court is not operating in fundamental fairness. I bring um, with me just the, um, the integrity and the knowledge that I bring. I have a knowledge base of the law and, and most of your candidates will have that. We all went to law school, we've all practiced law. So what differentiates me is I've represented families and um, not corporations. So I have a personal background of, of knowing how those uh, cases will impact individuals and family. I also just am a fundamentally fair person. I believe that everyone deserves the opportunity to be heard. The law is not always on your side. But you can still be treated with dignity. You can still be treated with respect when you come before the court. And we watched a, a situ situation after situation where cases that impact uh, the public are going before that court. And we have justices that will not recuse. The appearance of uh, impropriety must be dealt with. And even here on this court, because I've been the judge down in domestic and I've been a, uh, a lawyer that's practiced, any cases that I've touched in the domestic relations and juvenile court, I don't touch here. I have a wall between me and those cases. Any cases where I represented a party, I don't touch those cases. And it's imperative that the public have the... Um, initial uh, impression that they're going to get a fair hearing. That's what you come to court for, is for fairness. A lot of folks don't know what is the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. What is your scope? The Supreme Court only hears questions of constitutionality. Whether a law is constitutional, they'll take all of those cases. They will hear cases where there is a conflict between districts of the appellate court. So if one appellate court issues a decision and another appellate court issues a decision on the same type of facts, law, and circumstances, and come up with two different outcomes, the Supreme Court will hear that. And you can certify a conflict for them to hear it. They will hear cases that are great general importance to the public. So uh, the cases on um, redistricting of your congressional seats, redistricting of your House and Senate seats uh, in the state, uh, they'll hear those. Um, they will hear appeals from this court on cases that went before the Ohio Court of Claims. They do hear original actions, the mandamus, the prohibition. They will hear those. They also hear, which no one really talks about, is disciplinary counsel hearings, where a judge or a lawyer um, is being, has a case um, that's been filed against them for violating the code or uh, the codes and the canons or and causing the, the hearings that were before them to not be done in a fair and impartial manner. And those are very important to the public as well, that judges that are not performing according to the rules be suspended or disbarred just like attorneys. So those cases go before the Supreme Court as well, disciplinary. This is Carolyn Harding with Grassroot Ohio. And today I'm talking with Judge Terry Jamison. She's a candidate for the Ohio State Supreme Court. I would like to ask you about the gerrymandered situation. Um, many of us um, wanted the Supreme Court to hold the redistricting commission in contempt. That commission was seven people and the, the initial group was Governor Mike DeWine, Secretary of State Frank, Frank LaRose, Auditor Keith Faber, Senate President Matt Huffman, House Speaker Bob Cup, Democrat Senate Minority Vernon Sykes, 
and then Amelia Sykes, then uh, Alison Rousseau. So why didn't the Supreme Court hold them into in contempt? That's a very good question. Um, and one that can be answered very simply. You have seven justices on the court. You need a majority to find someone in contempt, just as you need a majority to even get your case into the Supreme Court. So unlike the trial courts, unlike the courts of appeals, you have no individual right to get to the Supreme Court. You have to file a um motion for the court to take jurisdiction of a case and you need four votes to get your case into the court. So if you cannot get four votes, your case does not get in. You cannot get four votes. You cannot get a contempt. I see. Well, as a Supreme Court justice, what would your role be regarding Ohio's new constitutional amendment protecting women's reproductive rights? Um, the court has no specific role unless something gets filed in court. The court does not go out and seek cases. So if someone files a lawsuit, it, it is a constitutional question that can only be answered by the Supreme Court. And as of right now, it is an amendment. It has been voted on. And the overwhelming majority of those that voted, voted for the amendment and it is part of the Constitution. But there are still laws on the book that um, are contrary to the new constitutional amendment. So can those laws come before you, the old ones? Or does the new constitutional amendment... Um, the, co the constitutional amendment supersedes. Supersedes. Yes, the constitutional amendment supersedes. Um, so any laws that were in effect, which is why <clears throat> there's talk that they are trying to find a legal way to maneuver, but it is a constitutional amendment. It supersedes any of the statutes that were in place at the time. No, thank you. That makes it real clear. But um, they are looking at some some changes to the law to try to supersede it, which would bring it back to the court because we would answer the constitutional question. This has been voted on. This amendment is part of the Ohio Constitution. Can you tell me, you're running against another Democrat for the primary. Correct. Can, can you let our listeners know why you believe you are the best um, candidate for this role and they should vote and why they should vote for you as to the other, uh, your opponent in the, in the primary. Well, I think that they should vote for me because I have a proven track record of fairness and working with men and women in um, the legal arena. Um, my opponent has three years of judicial experience. Um, I have 12, almost, almost going into my 12th year. Um, she defended corporations um, and had never def and has never described herself as defending people. Corporations are not people. People should um, have someone on that court that represents the average Ohioan. I'm the average person. Um, I've had experiences like most of Ohio. I've been laid off. I've been a single parent. I've worked two jobs. I've started a business. I've worked my way through law school and through undergrad. Um, I think I am more in touch with the ordinary average Ohioan that is just looking to have their case heard. Um, I was one that have lived many lives like most Ohioans. And I think it makes me more prepared and well-rounded. Um, when you've only practiced in one area of law, you only know that area. I've practiced in uh, criminal, domestic, juvenile, probate, federal court, um, administrative hearings. I've represented um, men and women in a multitude of 
types of actions. So I have experience in those areas. I've done complex probate litigation and I just am more well-rounded. I have a lot more community service. I'm a Red Cross blood ambassador. I sit um, not only on the board of Franklin that I told you about, but I'm on the board of counselors at Capital University Law School. I serve in many community organizations as well as on national boards with, uh, of judicial associations. I've been appointed to serve on the sentencing commission for the Supreme Court. I've been a court advise, on the court advisory committee for uh, security in the court. So I just, um, throughout my tenure as a judge, have made myself involved. I um, was also part of a data collection of um, data related to the disparity in school education among students uh, called Push Out, the Criminalization of Black Girls in School. I've been just uh, more involved um, than just sitting on a board even. I've been in touch with my community and all aspects of the community. I've attended many different organizations around the city regardless to um, what it was. If they ask me, I come and I speak and I've kept those relationships open so that the community knows you have a source of information. I can't give you legal answers, but I can tell you where to go to petition. I can tell you how to get the information and who are good sources for you. And that's who I am. And because of my, I believe I'm more innovative and creative with getting results. So this is a question that's near and dear to me um, and what Ohioans are dealing with at the state house, but what is your stand on separation of church and state? I believe there must be a separation, you know, and that's a wonderful question because when people hear separation of church and state, they think it's something that was instituted by the state, but it was actually requested by the church that the state not overreach into any religion. But I believe that you also have the right not to have a religion if you don't want a religion. So we have to have separation and your privacy rights are important. And it's a right to privacy. It's a right to exercise a religion or not exercise a religion. Just this last week, um, we've gone through the um, Jason Mead, former Franklin County Sheriff's deputy murder trial. Mm -hmm. And there was a recent, and recently it was decided it was a mistrial with mm -hmm. potential future a future in the trial in the future. Can you talk about that court case? I cannot talk about that case specifically because it is still being investigated to be retried. We don't opine on specific cases. Okay. I um I know that we have had I think a couple of officers that have been tried in Franklin County. That's the job of the prosecutor. And you know, we have a three-way primary for that position um, and a big race in November, but we can't talk about cases that potentially could come up on appeal or come up to the Supreme Court because there are questions of um, constitutional right to, to bear arms. We have a law here that says that you can open carry without a permit. So there's a lot of questions in that case. Yeah, Ohio has really had a lot of um, cases about um, the um, police force um, violence or um, shootings of um, a lot of black men, young black men. And I'm wondering with your background with juvenile court, what do you believe needs to be done to deal with that issue for the for the juveniles and the young men and then also with the police and restraining the the deadly force that goes to police training um 
and I think some cultural sensitivity and some um, explicit and implicit bias training, which I believe is also necessary in the court. I think you definitely need it in the court as well. We are a melting pot in Franklin County alone. You've got a large Bhutanese Somali, uh, Nepali, Palestinian, Jewish, um, I mean, you name it. And it, these they're residing in Franklin County. And one thing that I did um, was to go and spend time with the different communities so that I could find out their culture. Um, because people process and make decisions based on their culture. Some of it is, it's not, and 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 th this is so wild, but Denzel Washington was making a film and he said he was the only one that could direct the film. And um, so the question was asked of him, why do you think you're the only one? And he gave the example of the director Scorsese doing Goodfellas and um, I'm sorry, I forget the name of the director that did Schindler's List. But he said each one of those directors could have directed the opposite movie, but they would not have had the same culture because they come from different places. So anyone that does not spend time with other cultures is going to be insensitive to how they process uh, and make decisions because their culture is different. Um, I've met cultures where the female did not speak when her husband speaks. You have cultures where uh, the maternal side of the family is very dominant. So when you're dealing with cultures, you need to know what's going on in that culture. Hmm. Here's a, a big question. Um, where does Ohio stand legally on the death penalty and where do you stand? I cannot opine on where I stand. It is the law in Ohio. And because I'm sworn to uphold the law, I have to uphold the law. We haven't had um, an execution here because they said they don't have the appropriate means to do it. Uh, so there's some conversations about starting executions back up. And um, those are things that legislature and the governor will work out. And then the court will have to abide by whatever the law is at that time. All right, we're getting close. Um, one quick question. Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor was forced to step down due to an age restriction of 70 years old. Um, there, and yet our um, Candidates running for president are nearly eighty and eighty above. Do you believe that this? Is, <laughs> do you think this is uh, um, wrong? Do you think there should be an open, no restriction, or do you think a restriction is important? Real quick. Well, the public has voted twice to keep it at seventy. That's been on the ballot twice. Um, I think because the public has said that's what they want from their judges, then it. It's the will of the people. Where can voters find out more information about you? They can go to my website. It's vote, Terry, T-E-R-R-I, Jameson, J-A-M-I-S-O-N dot com. And you can find just about anything you want to know about me. You can follow me on social media at Jameson, number four, justice. At, that's on Facebook, Instagram, and X. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And I hope that between now and March 19th, you will go and vote for Judge Terry Jamison for the Ohio Supreme Court. I'm asking for your vote. Thank you. In addition to our Friday 5 p.m. broadcast on WGRN LPFM, Grassroot Ohio now airs on Sundays at 2 p.m. at WCRS FM. You can find us on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook, and, and Instagram. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.
Thank you. Oops, there we go. 